Sairam everyone. Um, we have been discussing about free will uh, as to what Swami has been telling in the discourse which we have selected for our study. Um, I think the last week uh, during the end, Swami was, um, we were discussing what Swami had spoken about Saranagati, Charanagati and uh, Samadhi. These are two, two principles Swami has uh, introduced while discussing the topic of freedom um, as the qualities which are necessary for us to experience total freedom. Um, so that's where we were. Um, I don't know whether we fully discussed the last uh, paragraph completely. Uh, we can proceed from that point, that's what I think. Sister Kalyan, if you have the paragraph which we read last time, we will start from there. Um, sure, um, I will just go to that one. Okay, thank you. You can read it, I guess. True meaning of surrender and samadhi. Some devotees declare that although they have surrendered themselves totally to Swami, their troubles and difficulties have not ceased. In my view, this does not indicate Shadanagati, real surrender. If it is true surrender, there is no place for speaking about the continuance of troubles and difficulties. Some others claim that they have experienced moments of samadhi during meditation. You can read the next paragraph also, sister. What is Samadhi? In common parlance, in the eyes of worldly people and in the books written by worldly individuals, Samadhi may be described in various ways. One may be in a state of trance during meditation, but this cannot be called Samadhi. It may be an emotional or mystical experience, or it may be the result of a fit. It may even be due to weakness. It is not samadhi. Samadhi means merging the mind in the atma. In that state, there are no two entities. Samadhi is a state of equal mindedness. In that state, there are no dualities like joy and sorrow, profit and loss, sin and merit, nature and paramatma. It is a state in which the oneness of everything is experienced. As long as differences and distinctions remain, there is no realization of samadhi. Thank you, sister. So as we can see, uh, Swami is uh, clarifying these two concepts for our benefit. Um, what exactly is surrender or sharanagati? Um, as Swami explains, if we have surrendered completely uh, to the Lord, um, there is there won't be any thoughts of, oh, I am going through troubles. Um, why is this happening? All such questions will not even arise because as long as those thoughts arise, and then there's no surrender. In the same way, Swami is also talking about samadhi because in common parlance, Many people uh, talk about various uh, uh, states of mind, which we either they have or they observe from others, and they call them samadhi. And Swami wants us to have a good understanding of what samadhi is. As Swami says, one who, Swami always says, sama is equal, dhi is uh, the intellect, 
uh, when we have that kind of uh, an intellect which is always in a state of equanimity um, that state is samadhi swami says where there will the soy, joy, joy and sorrow or profit or loss all of them will be treated uh, with the equal state of mind and that's what swami calls as samadhi uh, i think swami wants us to identify that uh, state of mind and try to cultivate that because that's what would grant us uh, some amount of freedom from the world um, i will pause here and uh, others can share your thoughts please Saira. There are no thoughts or questions or anything for us to discuss. I think then we can proceed further. Um, Sister Kandiyani, you can read on. As long as the mind is active, no one can be truly free. In the worldly sense, one may claim that this is my money, I am giving it to him. He may think that he is acting freely, but this is not real freedom. It is an act of goodwill arising out of the sattvic aspect of the mind. The mind is a mixture of all the gunas, sattva, rajas, tamas. At various times, different qualities are prominent. If you give a donation in response to the appeal of a man in need, it is a mental reaction to a particular situation and not an exercise of freedom. Hi, everyone. As we can see, uh, Swami is sort of pointing out to us that when their mind is present, there's no real freedom. And so on any of the gunas which affect the mind will limit the way we function or will have an influence on how we function. So that's what Swami has uh, explained here. Um, so I will open it up for any any of your thoughts or observations. Either. I guess um, I think because I think it may be clear, so there is no real discussion needed. We will continue on. Um, Sairam, sister. Sairam, maybe just a question here. Um, so Swami is saying that anything that we do through our mind, um, it's not really, you know, we have no free will in that sense. Like we may think that we're we're thinking something and doing something out of our own free will, but that's not the case. Um, so is it similar to how, you know, our body kind of digests food and circulates blood without our really doing anything about it? It just happens. Is that similar to the case of the mind? I think so, sister. The thing is, in the case of mind, it's slightly different because in the case of body, we have very limited uh, control. Uh, the natural laws affect it quite a bit. Whereas in the case of mind, um, because that's an internal instrument, uh, we have some level of, uh, I say, control, I would say. Um, however, um, even if we have some level of control over the mind, it's not total freedom. Uh, whereas in the case of uh, the body, I think we are totally at the mercy of uh, the uh, external circumstances and even the uh, natural laws to a great extent. That's what I think. Uh, I think uh, we can listen to what others have to say on this, Saira. 
Um, Sairam, um, the uh, this paragraph, you know, the the um, the maybe the underlying reason, you know, the, it's not clearly brought out. You know, the when I look at, I am trying to connect what Swami is trying to tell us, you know, the with this particular paragraph, you know, the um, whether you, the um, the why Swami has brought brought up the, you know, the even if you give a donation you know, the in response to the appeal of a man you know, the it is your mental reaction to a particular situation and not an exercise of freedom the uh, that could be this case but the uh, the so what is the connection between the donation giving and the and the exercise of freedom, that connection, you know, the, I'm not getting in here. Maybe uh, I'm missing something here. I know that, but uh, uh, because other paragraphs, it clearly, logically, I was able to understand what Swami is trying to tell. But in this one, the uh, the uh, the donation and the you know, the freedom. The I know because sometimes we may be thinking that you know I have the money you know the uh, it's my my decision to give out or not and uh, uh, that sort of uh, you know the thinking but uh, the, what is the connection between the you know the the mental thinking of you know giving out a donation and the exercise of freedom you know the, that connection you know the maybe i am missing that connection here okay Thank so, you, Saira. Saira, anyone who would like to comment on this please uh, Saira, because here when we give donation uh, to an afflicted person we are coming under the influence of our mind so we are not free from our mind, you know, to our samadhi, of course, uh, those, they are absolutely out of, con um, free from the mind's working. So, so, so long as we are uh, obligated to our mind, we cannot say it is freedom. Um, so, th th showing pity, uh, we may be uh, sadhik in uh, mood, but still it is mind working. So, um, so it, it uh, actually it is not uh, uh, freedom. It is not freedom because we are coming under the influence of our mind. It could be it could be sadhik, but still it is influenced by our mind. We are not not acting on our uh, atmic principle. For example, in the in the uh, Mahabharata war, uh, um, he was uh, Arjuna was under the influence of bodily connection. So bodily connection, but Bhavan wanted him to be atmic consciousness. Then only that the freedom is there. So here, not freedom. That's what I understand. Thank you, Saira. Saira, anyone else would like to share your thoughts, please? Uh, Saira, I'd like to share my uh, experience. Yeah. Can I speak? Go ahead, please. Okay. In one of those uh, paragraphs before, Swami has said, true freedom is when a man is free from impulses of the mind. So here, when we make a donation, definitely we cannot say that it is due to our atmic influence because we feel sorry for something or we feel okay it's good it always because the mind is um, influenced by the gunas and the gunas vary according to time at one time it is like this and at that time it is like different so it is under the influence of the mind that's what i think so it is not that he clearly states swami free True freedom is when the ma mom, when a man is free from impulses of the mind. So if the impulse um, 
makes us do something, the mind makes us do something, it cannot be considered as a freedom. It is at the spur of the moment, I think, oh, it is a good cause, let me. So that is, we cannot say that is the influence of the Atma. That is why it is not freedom. I think I understand that way. I don't know whether I'm correct. I understand that. Thank you, Saira. Saira, ma'am. Okay, Saira, sorry, Kumar. Uh, Saira, I just thought I can uh, share my experience. <clears throat> so when we donate money to back home, like schools or temples or any humanitarian cause, uh, when I donate, I, I feel the satisfaction and happiness just few days or few weeks uh, until I donate that back again. So um, I was, uh, as I progress, I thought the money is coming from God and it's going back to the good cause or goes, goes back to God. Uh, so I think as long as we think that money is mine, you will not feel that happiness forever. Uh, another example, uh, once I thought I should donate some money to a center and uh, I brought, a, a 50, for example, a $50 note for a save. Uh, and I kept forgetting to put that money in the tin box. Uh, and then for a few weeks, it, it's, it's, it stayed in my pocket. Then I, I realized, aha, as long as I think it's my money, Swami doesn't want my money because it is. we have to realize this is came from God. It goes back to God. So I just thought I should uh, mention it. Uh, we should not think that we are giving. It's not my money. It is money that God gave that we share it to the needy. Thank you, Sairam. Thank you very much, brother. Sairam, anyone else would like to share? Sairam, brother, the last sentence says, if you give donation in response to appeal of a man, right? we are giving. Um, that is a mental reaction we are giving. That is not a freedom. So now we are, I really want, would like to understand, so where, what is freedom then? From that last sentence, it's saying anything is not. So everybody's discussing on that and I, I'm not answering to Kalyani's question. I'm just thinking about the last sentence too. So if anybody could uh, clarify that, that's good. Thanks, Sairam. Sairam, sister. Anyone would like to, anyone else would like to share your thoughts, please? Uh, Sairam, it's, it's not an answer to Sister Aruna's question, but uh, in my mind, I asked this question to myself, you know, the, at the Samadhi stage, who is really enjoying that state of mind? You know, the, 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 that equal state of mind. Who is enjoying? You know, the, I am in, if I am at the samadhi state. You know, the, the, I am the one I am enjoying. So if if as a person or if as an individual, if I am just enjoying, what would be the uh, benefit? to the other people or the other world the uh, the if if there is nothing you know, if it is a samadhi state you know equal state of mind you know the i wouldn't be having anything you know the any senses or anything just i would i would be in the state i would just be enjoying so if i am enjoying you know the then what would be the benefit you know, the other than my enjoyment as an individual? Uh, I, I think I am missing something here because if all the sages and everything, they meditate and they are in the Samadhi state in the, and uh, we all studied that because of their, you know, the, uh, the um, samadhi state or the, their meditation or their st state, it brings all the goodness to the world. So maybe that part of connection is missing here. You know, the, otherwise, simply, you know, if I am thinking that if I am in the, you know, the samadhi state, if I am just enjoying, you know, if there is no benefit to the other people or world, then 
this is the only the just an individual benefit not the benefit to benefit goes to the other people maybe are we missing something here maybe someone can you know the uh, maybe tell us more about this one thank you saira sairam sister um, i think everyone has shared you know our under, their understanding um, i think in the next one, next paragraph i think swami is dealing with an answer um, but I do, I'll just point out, as Brother Surya Kumar said, the concept, you know, I am giving um, is, it's, it's, is, the, is the catch in, from what I understand. Because in, the, in the, this paragraph, uh, Swami says, in the worldly sense, one may claim that this is my money, I am giving it to him. When we have that such kind of thoughts, the mind is active. Uh, so the mind can uh, sometimes feel this way, sometimes feel the other way. So we are in the clutches of the mind. And another analogy which sort of comes to my mind is, for example, if there's a mother at home, um, the mother would like was busy with some work. Um, but then the child uh, comes and says, I want this, I am hungry or something like that. Uh, the mother, of course, uh, drops whatever she was doing and uh, serves food. Can we call this state of a mother a state of freedom? Um, because sometimes people are irritated. Uh, you know, I'm, I was doing this and now I am not free to do this. I have to you know, feed this kid, you know, can't uh, the child himself help uh, himself or herself? Those are thoughts sometimes crosses our mind. But on the other hand, then there may be someone who will not be bothered by it. You know, they will just drop it, uh, serve the food, and then continue what they are doing. Now, is there a difference in what they are doing? Because in the first instance, they, one may say, I am not free to do whatever I want. Um, in the other case, the person will say, okay, this has to be done, I will do it. So I think sometimes it's a state of mind. Um, what we think is, uh, uh, the situation at hand demands. Yes, as Sister Kadyani said, to some extent it is uh, a natural law, just like the physical aspect of it. Yes, there's definitely that element. But I think um, how, how the mind reacts also, I think, matters. Uh, in a state of surrender or in a state of samadhi, when someone functions, for them every action is the same. Uh, no action is better, no action is bigger, no action is important, no action is less important. Um, they just do it. And uh, they, are, they will not be affected negatively or positively uh, by what others may say or not. Uh, and they will not be agitated. I think that's what Swami wants us to be. So in that, when you're not agitated by the world, you're completely free. And uh, when you're agitated by anything in this world, you're not free. I think that's what Swami is trying to point out. So even the act of giving, if it is going to cause some agitation of some sort, oh, one, on one side you can say, oh, I gave. And it may give you a sense of elation. On the other side, you will say, why did this person ask, I have to give. Both are problem. Uh, in, in both the cases, we are caught by the mind. Um, um, that's what I, I think. Uh, I think Swami is further explaining it in the next paragraph, from what I understand. If there are no other uh, observations or thoughts from anyone, we can read the next paragraph. I hope uh, uh, we I can. Understand. Yes. In, the, in that case, uh, Samadhi stage, when Swami was in like, uh, um, physical form, that could be considered as a samadhi form then? Swami wasn't agitated with anything? Yes, Swami says this. We can, actually, we can do a study cycle on samadhi itself. Um, Swami says uh, many avatars have always um, exemplified the state of samadhi. Swami says samadhi is not a state where you know you swoon and then suddenly you fall down on the floor or you know you are saying things. Swami says that is just uh, not a permanent phenomena. The permanent phenomena of samadhi, samadhi has to be a permanent one, 
and that has to be experienced in every single act in which in which one engages consciously and so that's why when swami gives the example of rama rama shri rama when he was being going to be coronated he had a certain state of mind at the next moment when he was told you had to go to the forest it was the same state of mind he was not affected in the least by the turn of events and swami says that is acting in the world in that manner is the state of samadhi okay thank you thank you very much i am sir sir my uncle there's a question in the chat box oh i see Sairam, different qualities are prominent at different times. Are there any timelines that Swami mentioned for the gunas and the time-based prominence? Please mention if anyone is aware of. Um, so this question, Sairam, Sitaram, you asked this question. Um, and he's asking about timelines of the gunas. Um, our days, uh, Swami has divided the days into four uh, uh, time periods of eight hours, which are predominantly of a certain nature. Uh, from morning 8 a.m. to evening 4 p.m., Swami calls this the Rajasic time period when people are active in this world. Um, in the night, 8 p.m. to morning 4 a.m. is Tamasic when people would rest and not be active. Thomas predominates during that phase. Morning between 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. and evening between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. Swami says it's a sattvic time, the Sandhya time. And that is uh, the most sattvic time. And all sattvic activities can be undertaken. But I think all of us have our own uh, rhythm of uh, gunas so as long as this uh, from that we can see in this world as long as we engage in this world activities uh, some guna or other is always active um, so i don't know that's what i can say brother i don't know whether anyone has something to say he said how it came sandhya vandanam yes that is how the sandhya vandanam concept itself came up brother Brahma moves them in the morning. Good, good. Uh, so on. Thank you. So we can proceed to the next uh, paragraph, sister. A man swinging a stick on the top of his terrace may be free to do so. But he cannot do the same thing on the public road, lest he should hit someone who has an equal right to use the road. If he sw swings the stick on the road, either he may be arrested by the police or taken to a mental hospital. What a man does in his own house is not freedom, but indulging in satisfaction of his wishes. There is a real distinction between the exercise of freedom and the satisfaction of one's desires. The latter is based on self-interest. Freedom consists in the spontaneous expression of what comes from the heart in respect of any object or any individual at any time. This is true freedom. Thank you, sister. So as um, we can see, Swami says, I'll just highlight one sentence and then I will open it up for uh, discussion. Swami says, uh, when, whenever there's a self-interest, um, then uh, it is not freedom. And when it, there's no self-interest and it's a spontaneous uh, expression of heart, then he says there is freedom. So I think I will stop pause there and let anyone who has something to share, please go ahead. So 
Sai Ram Marano. This is yes. Saku Aunty. Yes, I just want to clarify one thing. That is, uh, when Atma don't, becomes more powerful and Atma does the uh, action, then it is not, uh, it is freedom. But when the mind and the senses get involved, then it is not freedom or free will. Am I right? Yes, Santi. I think that's what I also understand. But uh, we will ask others what they say. Thank you. Yes, Saira. Evidently, because somebody asked about Bhavan state, no? Bhavan, Bhavan is always acting, was acting. It is Samadhi. Because he never, he might pretend to be an angry or pretend to be a jovial or the humorous, but he he right from the beginning from the, his birth till he left um, the, the the body he was in a samadhi state because he was not influenced by mind or anything likewise we can see the jivan muktas in the world for recently we can see the ramakrishna varams or ramana maharishi uh, and uh, let, let me take Ramana Maharshi and he, he, he was working for the good of the humanity, at least a small portion, not like that uh, Baba, but he was catering to that, uh, that area, that, that people, um, so many things, in equal mindedness. And he never goes after that period, after he became given Mukta, he never went, went back into any Samadhi state, any any pretension. No, just he was like us, acting, speaking, and discussing, um, counseling, and encouraging um, everybody to be spiritual and uh, talking. So the, the, that is the Samadhi, uh, samadhi state. So, um when uh, when an uh, even mukta even mukta never see uh, other even baba used to say there is no other only one so the the even muktas he even mukta see him in others that is the state the they, they they don't they, they treat everybody as he so because he realized that oneness and that is the pure love that exhibiting the pure love and thus the um, service that that everybody we have to understand they they um, we have to uh, transcend um, the barrier of mind, body, mind, and, and ra 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 raise ourselves above this, uh, this gesture. That is our spiritual um, sadhana. So the, the understanding the oneness. So, so the he, 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 they were Baba right from the beginning were in real samadhi. And um, even even muktas were are in samadhi after the their, their state is there. Right? Baba is born samadhi. That's okay. Thank you, sir. And this is my understanding. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, brother. Sir, anyone else would like to share your thoughts, please? Sir, um, the discussion is very nice and profound and lofty. May I ask a very day-to-day -day worldly question? Uh, for example, there are some people who are opposing the mask. Uh, certain places, because of COVID, they say mask is uh, wearing a mask is mandatory, and some places it's not. Um, so, for example, at home I'm free not to wear my mask, but if I'm in a public place where I cannot maintain two meter safe distance. I'm supposed to wear a mask. Um, so this has nothing to do with my desires, nor um, freedom. 
I'm just trying to understand how to put this concept in day-to-day -day worldly life. We have to work, we have to be within the confines of this. Not all of us can go off into Samadhi state. Like earlier, I think Sister Ananti said, if everybody is in their own blissful state, then who will run the society? How will the, some, some people have to be living within the society? Sorry to ask such a worldly question. <laughs> After we were having such a nice, uh, profound discussion, but I'm just a little bit confused as to how to actually practically uh, adopt this. I wear a mask, but how do I explain to other people why they should or should not wear a mask uh, during current times? Sairam. Thank you very much, sister. Sairam, anyone else would like to comment on? I think the sister is asking a very practical question, I think. Sometimes, you know, we can have profound discussions, but if they don't have practical implications, they are of um, not much use. So I think it's a wonderful question from Sister Vasudha. Um, I will uh, like to request anyone, uh, everyone here to share any thoughts you may have on this, please. Sai Ram, uh, every one of us has the right to act on our own freedom, as long as it does not harm or hurt others. So if, uh, if wearing mask does not um, help others, like if they if they are uh, spreading virus, then they should be they should not think of their self-interest and they should be wearing too, right? So I think it's uh, it should, uh, our interest, uh, our freedom should not hurt or harm others, Sairam. Anyone else would like to share your thoughts, please? Sairam, I think the, the freedom consists of a spontaneous expression of what comes from heart. So um, when you think about others' health and things, then you will wear a mask. That is considered as a freedom because it comes from heart. Okay. Just uh, thinking of that. Thank you, Sairam. Sairam says, anyone else would like to share your thoughts, please? Brother Aaron, now could you please rephrase what Vasudha's question? The second okay. thing I understand, the first part I don't understand. Okay, I, I think it's just tied up, sister. You want to try or I will attempt to do and you can correct. Sorry, my question was how the word freedom is sometimes misused. I wear a mask, but I'm not able to convince other people. Uh, to wear my, my own teenage son, he says it's not cool. And he's my own son, but he's a teenager, and you know, teenagers want to be cool. So he's he's like he does sometimes doesn't want to go with me because oh, mommy will tell me to wear a mask. So um, and he says it's my human right and it's my freedom. I have to. You're not giving me freedom to do what I want. And I explained to him, being a doctor, I have so much data and statistics. <laughs> but I'm just saying, how do you convince other people? that don't misuse a freedom that's given to you. The objective is like Sister Aruna said, is that really what your heart or your conscience would say? Yeah. And, okay. Sairam. Sairam, Sister. They are immature, and also they, they can't understand that this, yeah, this is we are talking about the mature people actually. The 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 boy, the the we cannot understand the, the real significance of that for him uh, for him uh, to be free. Everybody will like to be free from anything. And so we, we, this is Baba is explaining to the, to the Ashpear. Uh, um, spiritual aspirant actually, they, because nobody, no other worldly people are going to read it and 
who was trying to help the people who who after uh, this one uh, spiritual purpose thank you sir thank you very much anyone else would like to share any thought please okay if there is no one else maybe i will just uh, share some thoughts which popped up when sister asked this question um the reality is that uh, all of us will be in different states of understanding in this world uh, at any point in time even in the medical field uh, things which they were considered sacrosanct maybe 5 years 10 years ago now have become uh, have been proven wrong and the humanity is always growing and trying to strive to get a better understanding but what happens is uh, people because of various afflictions of the mind um, feel that they are either free or they are bound by situations and rules and so on this is the reality in this world and anyone who feels the pull of the ego of mind will feel bound by various situations so now we understand that we are all following the rules of uh, the government and some of us feel that is the right thing because we have total faith uh, that the mask or uh, mask will protect us or the hand wash hand sanitizer will protect us because why do we believe because uh, there are some statistics uh, provided or uh, scientific bent of mind i guess and some people you know there are even among science scientific in the scientific community there is there are some conflicting opinions but the majority seems to feel that the masks and the hand sanitizers work and they will definitely stop the spread of disease um definitely there must be validity to it but then you know that setting aside the yes, people are going to feel bound or uh, free however they are uh, their makeup is but i think each one of us has to make our own choices of how we react to it um mm -hmm. we can as uh, sister as another sister said if you feel in our heart that we have to help everyone and even if it doesn't help if it makes them feel good about it i may it might as well do it um i think that's a uh, uh, state but that's an uh, perspective uh, we can have but you know i would also point out you know swami has said um it's chant the name of god and that will protect you from everything you know we don't uh, we, you know we ignore, most of the we may ignore uh, we may not have the same level of faith in the name of god as we will have the faith in uh, wearing a mask then what would swami tell how what can he say he can say how can i explain this to them they don't understand see swami's entire incarnation is to tell us how we should not harm ourselves and others that's the path of spirituality how many of us uh, practice what he say so i think uh, in the path of spirituality sometimes you know we ourselves maybe we are practicing certain things right but we may not be practicing many things right so we can say, imagine how much of frustration swami will face he will say i am for 8 years i have been telling no one is practicing anything um, so i you know i that I, that i found um, just the way you know mother finds you know i am able to explain to my child swami would have felt so miserable too and you know wondering how can i teach them uh, so those are some of the thoughts which i came up i guess you know as long as we are caught um in the clutches of the mind which is worldly focused uh, it's very difficult for us to accept uh, what may be good for us and uh, so so I, i don't think i have answered your question sister but maybe i opened up uh, a few other questions for us to ponder over sir so, sir if anyone else would like to share any thoughts so please go ahead
I, I think maybe in this context, I will also tell you know, it's I think many of you may have read in the Satyam Sun Sundaram when uh, during Swami's uh, childhood days, you know, when he was very young, uh, during his Patha Mandaram days, I think Swami was. Uh, apparently, there was a sannyasi uh, who was being taken by his followers everywhere. And the sannyasi was without, not wearing any clothes. He was supposed to be a digambara. He was naked. And he was being taken uh, by his followers to various uh, villages and towns. So apparently he came to uh, Puttaprati too. Uh, so, you know, so some people said, Swami, you know, he gets uh, uh, one total renunciate. Uh, he is not attached to anything in this world. Uh, he has come and we have brought, uh, why don't you come and see him? So apparently Swami went to see him and Swami took some clothes and went to see him and gave it to him and said, please wear them. Um, then, yes, then, you know, I think his followers were pretty upset that this, you know, this Digambara Sannyasi who is fully naked because he's not attached to the body. And he said, if you want to live like this, you don't need to travel from city to city. Okay. Uh, the real God, you know, if God will take care of everyone, uh, but you don't have to show this renunciation to the world in public eye. You can wear your clothes and in, in the society it is better you wear clothes uh, and walk around. So this was the teaching of Swami. So the things are any in, in society when we want to live, whether we uh, believe whatever they do or not, whether we agree or not, uh, sometimes for the sake of um, social decorum, uh, it may be better to, he said, you are attached, not attached to the body, but you're attached to all this name and fame. So you better wear some clothes and go about. That was what Swami had apparently told. So when sister told about the masks, I was reminded of that. So the thing is, even if we don't need the mask, um, as far as the saying goes, in Roman be, in Rome be a Roman. Uh, not because you want to be a Roman, but to the extent possible where it does not break it into your values, it may be helpful uh, to have some harmonious uh, coexistence in the world. Sahira. Sorry, it was a long-winded day. No one else is speaking, so I thought I'll fill the air. Um, if there's anything anyone would like to share, please go ahead. Sairam, Sister Kalyani, I think then we will move on and read on. Thanks. Uh, Sairam, just a quick question about what Swami says there about um, this is true freedom. Um, so it sounds like we we won't experience true freedom as long as we have any, um, you know, any mind left. And mind, as we learned earlier, was is, is desire. So as long as we have even a single desire, we will still have mind. And as long as we still have mind, we will never experience that true freedom. Um, I'm not sure if that is correct. Uh, and also if Swami is saying freedom consists of the spontaneous expression of what comes from the heart. Um, so I'm assuming that's, you know, once you're in that state of no mind. So it can't be just me speaking out without, you know, it's the first thing that pops up. Um, like it, that, that is a state that, you know, I guess, I won't be there until I ha until I get rid of the mind completely. Yes, I think my understanding is the same, sister. I think sister Sa Auntie Saku has already uh, aired the same thoughts. But I will ask if anyone else in the group uh, would like to share their thoughts. Uh, can I share something uh, here at this point of time? Yes, brother, yes. Uh, um... In fact, uh, I think what Swami wants to mention is, it's like, uh, oh, if all the events are free-flowing, like a free-flowing river, without any hindrance, that's what the the true nature is, or nature, or divineness, or whatever you want to call it. If there's a hindrance, then there is, we have some kind of problem. In the normal times, what happens is, you know, 
people who, uh, you know, like us. What happens is for every action, we have a thought. And for the thoughts, we use the mind. And it's like a, it's like a junction there. You know, we want to actually sometimes, you know, use the intellect. Sometimes we don't use the intellect. So it's a, it's a junction point, you know, whether, you know, we want to know, you know, which way we want to go. Then we use the mind to decide which action we should take. But that's, I, I think Swami wants to say that's not a freedom. The freedom should be, everything should be just free flowing. There's no mind involvement at all. I think that's what I want to say here. I, I may be wrong anyway. Thank you very much, brothers. Thank, Thank you very much. I think you were sort of, uh, I quote what Sister Kalyani was asking also. Thank you. Anyone else? I, um, even the river that flows free and uh, freedom uh, to its uh, will, it has banks on both its both sides. It has limits, right? It, as long as, again, as I said, as long as it does not harm or hurt one and others, freedom is okay. Sairam. 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 So we will move on, sister. Sairam, brother. Yes. So after all this discussion, now can you summarize right now um, with this all these input? What is real freedom is, please? I think, you know, the, summary the freedom, is, freedom is, is it a mind? When the mind is working, there's no freedom. It has to come from heart. So how I'm trying to understand that point. So mind shouldn't work then. So I'm trying to understand that point here, please. How that is heart only? So I think the question is a very valid one, so, sir. I think, I think we, uh, there doesn't seem to be any um, opposition to the thought that the mind should be completely absent, and only when the heart is functioning like a free-flowing river, as Brother Atma mentioned. Uh, then, so I think your question is, how do we know whether you know that what that action which springs from is from the heart or the mind? Uh, because I think that's what Swami is saying. If it's flowing from the heart, it is uh, freedom. If it's flowing from the mind, it is not. Um, I think uh, I, I will say this, whatever comes to my mind. Again, my mind, um, not from the heart, I guess. Um, but others can chime in. Um, the thing is, whatever our action, uh, after we... Uh, that action is done, it should not uh, leave any footprint. If you should not remember that, oh, we did something and feel elated, or we should not be upset that, uh, oh, things didn't go the way we wanted. When these, uh, I think that's the only symptoms by which we can identify that the mind was active or the heart was active. Okay. If the heart That's was active, we will not even feel what has happened. Uh, I'm reminded of a story of uh, Karna. I think Swami himself has also spoken about it. When someone uh, came to him to ask for arms, he was apparently uh, holding a golden cup and applying oil or something like that to himself. And that person asked, I need something. Uh, can you give something? So. Karna basically gave that gold cup to him uh, with his left hand. Um, so it was apparently a test, I think, uh, Devendra or somebody. So he said, uh, he gave, and then he said, why are you giving with your left hand? Um, so apparently Karna told, um, before I change that to the at hand to this hand, my mind may you know, ask a lot of questions. So it's better I give it. Um, I don't want to spend any more time, no give a chance to the mind to debate. So that kind of giving, uh, Karna was very famous for. So he also, I think, tried to practice that giving from the heart. Um, so I think um, 
we may not realize when we are doing the doing something whether it's coming from the heart or not but later on we will know whether the whether the heart was active or the mind was active because the mind if it starts claiming that it had done or it was upset with something then the mind is still active and as sister kalyani said as long as the, we reach the state of no mind or amanaska without mind state without any desire state uh, we don't have freedom and that's what uh, I, i could understand from based on all the discussions and all okay yes brother thank you so much as long as no footprint then it's a freedom okay thank you so much Sairam, Sairam. Uh, Sairam uh, before we move on, uh, when we discuss, I thought uh, uh, if if the heart is, you know, the, uh, how to differentiate whether it's coming from the heart or coming from the mind. Um, nowadays, I just remember Sister Vasudha indicated um, some people, they say, oh, these days, you know, I have forgotten everything. Even the, I can't remember what I said previously, and uh, uh, so the, the, the those dementia or the or the Alzheimer's state of mind, you know, the, uh, we all think that those are diseases. Maybe those are maybe part of this one. If we look at in the practical perspective, maybe the. Uh, I I was just wondering, you know, the if you know if if it goes from the heart, we wouldn't remember after it happened, you know, the whether it is right or wrong, whether it's good or bad. If we don't feel anything, you know, the that would be the you know the the uh, true you know the state of freedom or you know the true state of samadhi. or equal state of mind you nothing affected by anything maybe some people maybe we think that they are you know the uh, dementia or some types of disease maybe they could be in this state too we don't know that's so, my thinking thank you saira anyone else would like to share any thoughts please uh it's not uh, the answer to auntie what she said it's just i don't know um bhagwan forgive if there is some ego comes up but i would like to share my dream here which is very very close to my heart i'm i'm i have been a very analytical person means you know thinking a lot anything you do measuring everything informative decisions my mind was really really being occupied any action i take but being in the spiritual fold and reading swami's literature i was keep praying to bhagwan i mean this this mind is really keeping me occupied this is the right way i mean i really prayed up prayed there was a dream which uh, came where i saw myself lying on the floor and i saw a person is killing me like literally top of me i i could see myself lying it's a big hall and somebody's on top of me and killing me and right away i saw my body turn into swami and that person vanished and i couldn't interpret what this dream is all about and i usually write my experiences and all of that so when i was writing brother aruno i i don't know if i've shared with you but when i was writing it was not my thought i know what swami has asked me to write when you are so analytical using your mind you will kill yourself when you develop divine consciousness which is me there is no room for anybody there is no mind there and that's what i learned from that any act you do the freedom is that any act you do there should not be chain reaction or anything you just offer to him and that's how it is i mean that dream is still so 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 vivid that you know how my body turned into him and the lesson he asked me to write is when i turn when my body turned into him i am dev that divine consciousness so there is no room for mind when divine consciousness take place sai ram thank you very much sister thanks thank for sharing very so i think sister shivani has sort of summarized the uh, um, discussion because once we think that we have given we are giving it to swami no one else we will never think uh, twice about it because we'll be happy with the thought that we have given to swami we will 
there will be no sense of ego um, what came from the lord was given to him uh, there's nothing more uh, the only the joy of um, having interacted with the lord remains with us um, and i think that is total freedom because we are not uh, bound by anything the mind is absent i guess thank you very much sister saira okay sister kalyani maybe you can read now everyone has the divine potential in him you should not think that men who have achieved eminence or the high intelligence displayed by some persons owe their accomplishments to some external power the talents have emerged from within themselves all powers are within you you have no need to go to someone outside for achieving anything all that is needed is the external manifestation of the powers within you the main sadhana you have to do is to control the vagaries of the mind krishna told arjuna that his mastery of archery was not conferred on him by his preceptor but the preceptor only drew out the abilities that were already in him no preceptor can enable a disciple to accomplish what is not potentially within him when you dig a well and find water at a level of 100 feet the water was already there you merely found it by removing the earth above it likewise men tend to forget the divine potentialities in them because of identification with the body sairam sister um, uh, such a valuable uh, set of uh, words from swami um, it's just is telling us how we can go about finding the divinity within us by digging deep um, and depending on ourselves um, that's all i can say and find true freedom i guess in that process um, i will uh, let anyone share your thoughts please sairam Sairam brother, how did you connect this to freedom? I am sorry, I missed it. So I think I think the analogy which brothers brother Atma mentioned, you know, like a flood, like a river, we should flow. The water is the perfect example of that which flows, even if there are impediments, it just runs around it. it is never stops it flows and it is not affected by the least by that um it does not fight with anything it just flows so i uh, swami says that kind of water is within us which is the total real freedom um and i think the vagaries of the mind is the soil which is covering it sometimes depending on the amount of vagaries of the mind uh, we may have to dig that much deeper Uh, and throw away that vagary of the mind and uh, we will find water um is what i think so that is the real freedom that's the atman and that is our heart whatever it is so um, the freedom comes by removing the dirt of the vagaries of mind which covers the water which is very deep within wait, 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 wait. so by digging deep within ourselves removing all the uh, unnecessary complexities thrown out by the mind which is covering our real reality of freedom we remove it and we find the water the water of the water which is the spirit um, and once we find that um, we are totally free is i think what swami said that's what i understand but i will let others uh, share this thank you thank you much it's very good Mm. Uh, Sai Ram, may I uh, say something about this one? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in this one, uh, one particular sentence it attracted me. No preceptor can enable a disciple to uh, a disciple to accomplish what is not 
potentially within him. So if that is a true statement, say for an example, you know, if we don't have the, you know, the potentiality you know, within us, even if we uh, you know, uh, come for study circle, or even if we have a guru, you know, trying to learn all these, you know, the uh, the uh, all these maybe the the uh, uh, steps or to uplift our you know the spiritual path, it wouldn't help us or with a something different uh, in that particular sentence you know. Unless we don't have the potentiality within us, it could be coming through our you know, the past karma or you know, whatever we earn merits. You know, the, if it is within us, then only we can pursue or we can move on into the spiritual ladder. Otherwise, you know, the, it wouldn't help us at all kind of. Uh, is my understanding correct or whether you know the is something more than uh, from my understanding or if something different from what I understand from this particular sentence thank you Saira Sairam sister um, I will ask anyone who is in the group to share your thoughts to what sister Ananthi has uh, mentioned here Sairam. Sairam, auntie. I think, according to what I have read here, everyone has the divine potential in him. According to Swami, everyone has. There's no question of not having. That's what I feel. Everyone has. And depends on how we remove the obstacles and uh, go forward in our life. So according to Swami, I think everybody has the potent. That's why I, but I understand. I don't know if I'm correct or no, but according to this, everyone has the divine portion. But Swami says, doesn't go wrong. So I thought, uh, I don't understand what Swami is trying to say. Thank you, Saira. Saira, the, the, we have to look at the previous sentence. Krishna told Arjuna that his mastery of archery was not conferred on him by his preceptor, but the preceptor only threw out the abilities that were already in him. We know how intelligent the, uh, the Arjuna, you know, how intelligent and how perfect you know, the, uh, man is uh, uh, Arjuna. You know, and uh, the, even for him, you know, the, the, uh, Krishna told, the, uh, it, it's because you have all your abilities, that's why you are maybe your guru throne chariot, you know, the, he was able to, you know, bring out your abilities, you know, the uh, into this, you know, the higher level or very extraordinary level. So uh, that's why in my subsequent sentence, it gave me a clue that, you know, unless otherwise, if we have the sharp, you know, the, maybe this uh, spiritual thirst or some sort of potentiality, you know, the, from our past karma or something, you know, the, uh, the uh, my reason for was asking for this particular sentence because of the uh, the previous two sentences. You know, the thank you, Saira. Thank you, sister. Saira, uh, yes, sister. I agree that there is. Uh, it seems like the sentences are contradictory to each other, but like another sister mentioned, the a concept is that the divine potential is within each individual. So don't have to look for an external preceptor to manifest that from yourself. Um, actually, if you yourself dig deeper and deeper, and for me, it might be like 1,000 feet instead of 100 feet, um, because I, I don't feel I'm anywhere spiritually mature uh, but what i'm trying to say is ultimately it's not even a preceptor ultimately it's 
um, probably he means that ultimately it's you yourself that can then um, help bring these to the surface and then a preceptor may be able to fine tune them perhaps. And then there's difference between uh, physical skills like archery and things like that versus mental and emotional and spiritual skills. And spiritual skill is something that you have to sell. It's a matter of self-discovery and you dig deeper and deeper within yourself, something like that, maybe. Oh, good, sister, thank you. Anyone else would like to share your thoughts, please? In that sense of anyone else wanting maybe in time, uh, almost nearing end, I will share some thoughts. Um, I think the contradiction which everyone, saw, I think some of you have mentioned, maybe because Swami says there's divine potential deep within. Then Swami also is talking about uh, Drona Charya, drawing out that potentiality from the disciple. And then Swami also says there's no need to go outside for looking for it uh, from someone. I think those are the uh, three or four sentences which seem contradictory. Um, so I will just uh, narrate what I think is my understanding so that others can share their thoughts, please. Uh, the thing is, I think there is no dispute that all of us have some dis, uh, divinity in all of us. Not some, we have divinity in all of us. And I think what Swami wants us to know is that the entire sadhana process is to find that. Find what is deep within us. And I think why Swami is pointing out that we should not be going to anyone else is uh, because many people go from X, Y, or Z, uh, Guru, without making any effort to find the divinity within them. So then what happens is they think there's something not, we don't have, we have to go and find it. That is why we run from uh, uh, one Guru, another Guru, or every Guru possible. Because we don't understand that the divinity is deep within. And for that, the maximum effort which has to be expended is we trying to dig it deep within us. But we also need some help at times because when we don't know how we are doing it or to get some guidance of how to dig, dig, you know, dig deep within, for that a guru is always useful. They're a catalyst. But even when we approach a guru, we should understand what are we learning from that guru. So if you think that guru is going to do something and that's going to change my life, then that is wrong. Because sadhana is an individual effort. So we have to go and find out from others what we can do in our own search of divinity within us. I think that's what Swami is trying to point out because sometimes we want an easy solution. We don't want to make any effort. We just run here or there and we think we can buy it from someone. Many people charge money. You go and attend discourses and you know it sounds very sound. And people can even give you or do this kriya or something like that. And we do it for some time and then we don't find it. Then we drop it and then we go to somebody else who says they have another kriya. Or you know, if they touch you, then you will find it. Swami says it cannot be found like that. Um, the guru can also be, be a catalyst and uh, he can give you some instructions of what you can do to find it within you. So the maximum effort all of us have to put in is within our own self to try to find the divinity within. And the real guru is one who drives you to do that, uh, to look within, give us the tools, the knowledge, um, the practices which can help any one of us uh, do, do whatever, whatever sadhana we choose. And the guru should be able to help us with that. So I think that's what Swami is trying to point out. So the thing is, we may need a help from guru, but the help from guru is to learn how to dig deep within and find our own heart and the waters within ourselves. 
spirit within ourselves. That's what I think I understand. Um, I will stop here. And if anyone else has something to share, please uh, share. So. I guess there's no uh, no one saying anything. Maybe I was just off the mark completely. It doesn't matter. I think Swami will uh, reveal to us whatever each one of us have to understand from here. Um, I think it will take us a time to go and contemplate on this more, I guess. Um, uh, we can continue from this point uh, next week and we have a week to contemplate on this. You know, how do we dig deep within? How do we, you know, get the help from any guru uh, or Swami in our case to find that divinity from within? Make all the effort to find that. Uh, not run here or there because there's nothing new to be found anywhere else. Um, with that uh, thought, I thought we will close the session today with Samastha Loka. I'll pause for a few seconds. Uh, Say 10 seconds to see if anyone has something to say or ask anything. Otherwise, we'll close with Samastha Loka. Sai Ram. Sai Ram, uh, brother, you know, after you have explained, uh, now when I look at that particular sentence, Swami would have meant by that one, Iridi. Even if you go different, Iridi, preceptors, Iridi, you are not going to get the one unless otherwise, if you unity get into your uh, spiritual ocean deeper and deeper unity now it uh, makes sense thank you saira it's a lovely uh, explanation thank you sairam sister sairam we will close with samastha loka sukhino bhavant sir om Samaste loka sukhino bhavantu Samaste loka sukhino bhavantu Samaste loka sukhino bhavantu Om Shanti 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 Sai everyone.